When you have the negative, you are ready for the last step in the photographic process, printing the positive. People will judge the quality of a photograph by what they see in the print. So care in making the positive is just as important as care in taking the picture and processing the negative. Let's go into the dark room and see that it's properly set up for making good prints. Naturally, your dark room should be tight as far as outside light is concerned. But you'll need light to work with. So check your safe light to see that it has the correct filter. Yellow for low sensitive contact papers, orange for enlarging papers which have a higher sensitivity. Your dark room must be clean and that means clean all over including the sinks. Otherwise your prints may come out spotty and dirty. Trays should be spotless. If they're not, they may contaminate the solutions you are using. The good craftsman always keeps things where they'll be within convenient reach. Towels, print tongs, thermometers, all these should be placed so they're handy when you need them. Check the water supply so that once you're in operation, you aren't caught with a lack of water or find the water to be of the wrong temperature. Incidentally, for your own comfort, check the ventilation. Dark rooms will get stuffy if the air circulation is out of order. If you're using trays, you'll need three. One for developer, one for rinse or short stop, and one for the fixing bath. Before you start printing, you should have all your solutions ready. The chemicals are dissolved in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions to make up a stock solution. When ready to use, you take one part of developer stock solution to two parts of water. It is important that your solution should be within a degree or two of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Your fixing bath should be mixed full strength, ready to use. If you use an acid shortstop in the rinse tray, use one and a half ounces of 28% acetic acid to each 32 ounces of water. Your solutions are now ready. So let's look at the printer, the machine you'll use to expose your prints. One type of printer in wide use has a lamp house that encloses several electric bulbs. Check to see that all desired lamps light up as you work the exposing light switch by hand. Some printers have individual switches for each lamp in addition to the main or exposing light switch. This provision is useful if you need to turn off one or several lamps, but more about that later. To bring paper and negative firmly together, the printer has a pressure platen. As the platen comes down, it automatically operates the switch that turns on the printing lamps. Releasing the platen switches off the printing lamps. In addition to the printing lamps, there is an orange or ruby tinted pilot light that helps you to see what you're doing as you place the negative and paper on the top surface of the printer. This surface is a transparent glass plate. It must be clean and free of dust, otherwise prints will have smudges and pinholes. 
Below the top, you will find one or more panels of ground glass, whose function is to diffuse the light, to make it strike evenly all over the negative. The printer has an adjustable masking device for holding negatives and for making borders on prints. The negative is placed dull side up, that is, the emulsion side is up. If you're going to make several prints from a single negative, it's best to fasten it down with scotch tape. Now it won't tend to slide around, and you won't have to center it for each print. Now with negative in place, the print paper goes on top of it, emulsion side down. As the platen is brought down all the way until it latches, firm contact is established between paper and negative. Check your timer. If it's spring operated, wind it up so that you'll have it going when you need it. So far, we've been demonstrating the equipment you will use. Now for the actual steps you will go through in making prints. Let's suppose you get a batch of negatives to print. Among a batch of negatives, you may find some that are very contrasty, perhaps one or more that lack in contrast, as well as those that have normal contrast. Regardless of contrast, a photographer is expected to make good prints from every negative. There are printing papers to suit a wide range of contrasts. Here's the negative you are about to print. It is a good negative and has a normal contrast, so you select a normal grade. All right, you are set to go, provided you do something more. And that is to determine how long a printing exposure to give. The exposure will depend, for the most part, on the density of the negative. In any batch of negatives, all having normal contrast, you may find thin ones and those that are very dense, in addition to those that have a normal density. You estimate the exposure to give, basing your estimate on the density of the negative. We'll suppose your estimated exposure is seven seconds. Now for the actual steps in making a photographic print. First, turn out all lights in the dark room except the safe lamps. With negative in place and mask properly adjusted, you can proceed. But it's difficult to get exactly the right exposure the first time. So to avoid wasting a lot of paper, you cut up a sheet into test strips. You expose one test strip to the estimated exposure of seven seconds, one to a little less, say five seconds, and one to a little more, say 10 seconds. In using test strips, lay them down so as to include a fair sample of the negative's range of tone, from lightest to darkest. Your test strips are developed to the time recommended for the paper and developer you are using. Remember the temperature of the developer should be 68 degrees Fahrenheit for best results. At the end of the development, the test strips go into the shortstop bath, then the fixer. Now your inspection indicates that your estimated printing time of seven seconds is correct, and you can proceed. Center the paper evenly with the mask, so the margins will be even all around. Stay at the printer until the exposure is completed. If you wander away, you may possibly forget and leave the lights on so long that the negative might become damaged. Now for development of the print. Getting the print into the developer in just any old way won't do. Place the print face down and drag it along the surface of the developer so it wets evenly. Flip it face up and slide it under the surface.
Push it under so that it will be entirely immersed for the full development time. You can see the image develop. Gentle stirring is helpful in assuring even development on all parts of the print. If the print is taken up for inspection and held out of the developer very long, the developing action is interfered with. Furthermore, your fingers might cause a stain and chemical fogging might set in on the print surface. Learn to judge the developing action while the print is in the solution. When the print is almost finished developing, lift it out and lay it on the surface of the solution for examination. Check the tones in the print. The lighter areas should show detail, and so should the darker half tones. The dark half tones should not be allowed to go black. If your developer works well, if it's not exhausted, your print should develop up in the time established for the particular paper and developer you are using. Now, here's your fully developed print. It looks pretty good, but perhaps this dark area is too dark. Let's see how we go about improving it. With this type of printer, you can place shading material such as tissue or tracing paper to cut down the intensity of the light over any portion of the picture area. Now I'll make another print to prove the shading is correct. With some printers, those having a switch for each light, some of the lights can be turned off to reduce the light to the area to be shaded. Now let's return to the developing process and see what we must do to complete the making of the print. When development is complete, the print goes to the rinse bath, where it remains for a few seconds. The rinse bath can be plain water, but an acid short stop is best because it quickly neutralizes the alkali in the developer, stops the developing action at once. The acid short stop is more important for paper than for film because unlike film, the paper base absorbs developer. The acid short stop penetrates the paper as well as the emulsion and prevents development from continuing. The acid shortstop also prevents contamination of the solution into which you next put the print, the fixing bath, where the undeveloped silver in the print emulsion is dissolved away. It's very important that all the undeveloped silver be removed. If a fresh fixing bath is used, fixing takes only a few minutes. It should take from eight to 10 minutes, never more than 15 minutes. You cannot check whether the fixing bath is fresh and active or exhausted by a mere inspection of the paper print. But a piece of undeveloped negative film can be used as a test for the fixer. When the milky appearance of the film vanishes, the half time period for complete fixing action is established. Suppose it takes four minutes for the film to become clear. Then it will take another four minutes for complete fixing, eight minutes altogether. Don't leave prints in the fixing bath too long or they will start to bleach and you'll get prints like this in which highlight details are lost. After a print is fixed, it must be washed thoroughly to remove the chemicals of the fixing bath, which have been absorbed by the emulsion and to some extent by the paper base. Small batches of prints may be washed in trays using successive changes of water. This method is used when it is necessary to economize on water. Remember that with tray washing, short soaking in many changes is much better than long soaking in few changes. Another method of tray washing frequently employed is to use a siphon device, which attaches to the water faucet. A continuous change of fresh water takes place, while at the same time, the flow moves the prints about assuring good separation between them. Ordinarily, a mechanical washer is used.
This has a motor-driven drum. The rotation agitates the prints, assuring thorough washing, while the constantly changing water carries away the chemicals we want to get rid of. After washing comes drying. Drum type dryers are commonly used. For glossy paper, the drum in the dryer has a polished chrome plated surface which imparts a high gloss. Excess water is drained off before the prints go face up on the canvas that carries them around on the drum. A high gloss is also obtained by using ferrotype plates which come in several sizes and in two types, black enamel coated and chromium plated. Excess water is squeezed off when the prints are put on the plates. This may be done in a wringer. A hand roller also can be used, as well as a flat rubber squeegee. The plates are set on edge to dry the prints. Air circulation is helpful to attain uniform drying. Prints on matte or semi-matte paper are dried on drum dryers which do not have a polished drum, the prints being placed face down on the canvas. Matte prints also can be dried by hanging, preferably in air that's not too hot. If prints are left hanging for long in hot, dry air, they curl excessively, become brittle and hard to handle. Another way to dry matte prints is between photographic blotters. No matter what method is employed for drying matte prints, excess water should first be removed by running the prints between rollers or by using photographic blotting paper, which leaves no lint on the prints as ordinary blotters will do. The best ways to dry prints on non-shrink, non-stretch paper is to hang them in the air or to put them on drying frames. Dried prints are finished prints as far as processing goes, but you're not through with them yet. If prints need trimming, now is the time to do it. Then you can go ahead with any additional work, such as dry mounting or touching up spots. As we have said before, people judge the quality of a photograph by what they see in the print. So it's of the greatest importance that all prints sent out are the best possible every time.